morning, everyone. Come on, y'all already serving God and worshiping and praising. So let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. <clears throat> All righty, let's, uh, let's get started. This, uh, Chad, if you will come up and open us up in prayer, we greatly appreciate it. Hey, Ella. How you doing? Okay. Okay. Glory be to God. God, we come before you right now and acknowledge you. You are God, God alone. We thank you, Lord God, for waking us this morning, uh, allowing us to arrive here safe and sound, each and every one of us. We thank you for the word that you're about to allow us to, to, to bet on, Lord God. Open our hearts and minds to receive you with clarity, Lord God, and just let the word be simple. Father God, give us understanding, wisdom, and knowledge, and increase us, Lord God, that we may have increase in the application of your word. We thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the, the shepherd that you've given the word to, Lord God. But thank you for increasing us this morning by your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Okay, we've been talking about giving, right? Well, still hadn't got there yet, has it? My mess with my money, man. It just kind of bothers with my whole makeup. Even make my breakfast act funny. Yeah, yeah, I hear you talking. The proof is in the doing. <laughs> So we've been talking about giving, and we, we've uncovered a lot of, uh, uh, of scriptural facts in the, in the Word of God concerning giving. The first one, we understand that God is a giver. Uh, and so if God is a giver, we as children of God uh, are mandated by his Word to be givers. Same in that. Uh, we, we've looked at a number of things, uh, but uh, the first thing we did was we talked about faith in January. And so it takes faith to be a giver. Because that giving has to be based on the word of God and faith has to faith does come by the hearing of the word of God. Say amen to that. So you can't you can't give without giving in faith. And then we looked at if you, even if you have the faith, the the mindset in which you're giving has to be different than uh, any other mindset. Uh, we talked about uh, giving in secret, how giving is personal. It's not based on you being flamboyant with it or letting everybody know what you did, you could do that, but understanding that's your reward for giving. Uh, the idea is you give, and uh, it's, it's so personal that the Bible says when you give in secret, God will reward you openly. Yeah. Say amen to that. So, it's, it's so, so the idea is, uh, is I don't have to impress you with what I give. I have to give with the right motive to God. Then he'll impress you that I've been giving. Well, I thought that would do it for you, but I guess that won't do it for you either. Amen. So when we looked at looked at a number of things, so we, un we understand that. And then we looked at this tithing or this idea of giving, that, that it was started with Abraham even before the law was given. And how Abraham gave tithes of all he had because uh, a giving again should be, gone, be given, should be done out of a grateful heart and with a grateful attitude because of what God has done. And it should be done with humility where the individual realizes if I have it, it's because of God. If I'm going to have it, it's because of God. If I'm going to ever keep it, it's because of God. Which, which then the believer understands how much control he or she has given God over their entire life and the resource that he has blessed them with and supplied them with because that believer believe, not only believes but understands that everything belongs to God. And God has always established with his people that a portion of everything he has, or has given to any individual comes back to him. That portion always comes back to him. Say amen to that. So this morning we're going to continue looking in that vein and, and I'm going to take you to the book of Malachi, but we're going to look with some fresh eyes. I'm going to teach you this morning, well, with the aid of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to take anything for granted. First, I'm going to teach you this. I'm going to show, we're going to show you this morning with the help of the Holy Ghost, uh, the warning of why God warns us not to rob him. Yeah. You ever think about robbing when people rob folk? You, you probably don't think about that, but when people rob folk, you know why the, pe the person getting robbed, why the person that gets robbed gets so upset? Bigger than that. What else? Violating is good, but it's bigger than that. They, they, they don't get mad because they've been violated. What else? What, you, what, 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 what really happened? If you, if you were to walk out of here today and get robbed, and um, once you got over the shakiness of it, you would be really pissed off. I know you're not supposed to say things like that in church, but it makes good understanding. So what happens to a person when they get robbed? They get mad. They get really mad. 
But why do they get really mad? No, it ain't the working hard. No, it ain't the work for us. What else? Come on. They took something that belongs to you. And they had no business doing that. Anytime someone takes something that belongs to you, you get really mad because that's yours. It's not a matter of fact what you work for and all that kind of stuff. The fact is it belonged to you, and then they had the unmitigated gall to just come and take it. Then ask. So we're going to find this morning why we shouldn't take from God what belongs to him. That's what Robin is. Robin is when you take something for someone that belongs to them. Not you, to them. I thought that would do it for you, but I guess, you know, turn to, <laughs> turn to Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse number 6. Now, when God, in the, uh, again, many times in, in studying the word of God, uh, I don't know about you guys, when I was coming through, they really tried to make me disown the Old Testament, make me believe that the Old Testament, what God commanded in the Old Testament was not relevant in the New Testament, that I didn't have to follow the Old Testament, that I didn't have to obey the things that the that the Old Testament had to say, and, along the, and, and only to find out that they were really mistaken. And, uh, mistaken might be, they were just wrong. They was wrong for telling me that because you have to take in the whole counsel of the Word of God in order to really understand what God wants from you and how God wants you to do what He wants you to do. Amen? So in Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse number 6, as, as we approach this idea of tithing, and tithing is a how much of giving? A tenth. And it's not only a tenth, it's the first tenth. Say amen to that. It's the first tenth. So when Abraham, we, we saw in, uh, in our text uh, last week, when Abraham had that one-sided victory against all those kings in that land, the first thing he did was gave Melchizedek, and who Melchizedek was standing in representation of? God, Jesus, all right? So, so now, so, so then who on the planet stands in representation of God for you to give your first tenth in the church, right? Say amen to that. Now, so he says then, so after he had that one-sided victory, uh, God, made, God brought Melchizedek on the scene for the express purpose of Abraham giving him a tenth of all he had. And he gave it, again, out of gratitude and in humility because of what God had done for him. Say amen to that. And, and we looked at last week and we said, and if we would we really just look at how much and how many times and how consistently God has blessed us, that alone right there, that alone should inspire us to give. Say amen to that. Doesn't matter what kind of income you have, fixed, molded, bingo, whatever the case may be, we, are, we should give God out of gratitude and in humility because of what he has done. Say amen to that. Now, again, so in this particular text, in the book of Malachi, what has happened is Israel, the children of God, have abandoned the practice or the commandment of giving. They have abandoned it. They've quit doing it. They've stopped giving. Now, many times when that happens in a congregation, because we have to make everything relevant to do it, many times when that happens in a congregation, people get mad at the pastor or their finances don't seem like they can stand it or whatever reason, they make a decision not to give. Or they'll sit here and listen to my preaching and then tithe all their money to somebody else in another place where they're watching on TV. Say amen to that. So they come here and rape God here and then give the money somewhere else. I wish I had a win. But anyway... We don't want to talk about that too much. But anyway, so the idea then is so, so a person makes a decision not to give. Everybody is able to give. Say amen to that. But many times it's all in how it's, it has to do with faith, of course. If I don't have faith in the word of God, I'm never going to see myself in a position to give like God requires of me. Say amen to that. So we, we, get, we get fearful of our obligations, fearful of money, fearful of things like that, and then we make a decision not to give. Well, after a period of time of doing that, you get comfortable in your not giving. Now, watch it. When you stop giving or stop practicing giving like the Scriptures command, something does happen. Many believers don't even recognize it. 
because they haven't really recognized what God has done anyway. So if you don't have them recognize what God has done, you're definitely not going to recognize when something goes wrong. You're going to look at it, is that just the way my life is? <laughs> Say amen to that. Well, in verse number 6 of the text, in Malachi chapter 3, God says, this, this is scenario, they had stopped giving. Say stop giving. Not only had they stopped giving, now in those days, their giving was based on their crops and things like that because they was basically farmers, okay? So we're going to have to translate that from farming to now. Now, nobody in here farms, so don't be bringing me no collard greens. <laughs> don't be bringing no pies and cakes to the church. Say amen to that. That's how people used to pay the pastor years ago. And that's how they used to give to the church in trade. You teach us and we'll bring you a cake. Well, you can kind of understand it then because of lack of the knowledge of Scripture and nobody to teach it. They just kind of adopted whatever way they wanted to adopt it. But in Israel's case, right, that was, that was, that was the, that was the, first there was the tabernacle. Uh, then there was the temple, say temple. And the temple was the place where they brought all their goods to the priest. And they would take, now what do you think the priest did with those goods? When they brought them, they had to bring the first of everything, sheep, goats, pigs, corn, all that kind of stuff. What do you think they did with that stuff? Hmm? They used it to feed other peoples and they lived off of it themselves. It was their, it was their way of making a living because they were not allowed to have jobs or farms like the other people because their strict calling was to maintain the temple and take care of all those things that God needed him to do so that the people could get what they needed, say amen to that, through his efforts. Say amen to that. All right, now, so they had stopped giving. Nobody was bringing any turkeys. Nobody was bringing anything to the temple. Say amen to that. If you translate that to the day, the church was, was struggling because they could barely meet their financial obligations because the people refused to give. And when, they, when the church can't meet their financial obligation, it is impossible for that particular church to do ministry in the, name of Lord, in the name of the Lord because lack of funds. So when they stopped giving, the priest had no food to give those who were sick, no food to give the widows, no food to help with anything like that. There was no provisions. There was no provision. See, now, when you talk about giving, so that means the believer understands that it's my, my responsibility as a child of God to make sure the church has the resources that it needs to do the work of God. And in those resources, the leader or the pastor or the priest is, is allowed to live out of that. All right. Now, so in verse 6, they had stopped doing that. So here's what God says to them. When Malachi the prophet comes on the scene and he's, he's now relaying to them what God has said about their, their, their willful neglect of giving. He says, in verse number 6, he says, For I am the Lord. Then he says, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, it sounds like it said, I don't change, and it sounds like y'all about to be eat up, ate up, right? But what he's actually saying is, in, in, and like I said, when, the, when this was written in the Hebrew tongue, it had a different meaning than we understand in English. First, he acknowledges, he said, I'm the Lord, I change not. Now, when God is talking about that, he had gone into covenant with Israel years and years ago, right? Say covenant. God, and that's an agreement between two entities, right? So God had gone into covenant with Israel through blood. Say amen to that. And we'll talk about covenants maybe later. But he was saying, I, and it, since Lord, he says, I'm the Lord, I don't change not. God says, I don't break my covenants. And y'all went into covenant with me that y'all were going to do this. But I don't break covenant. What do you mean God didn't break covenant? He said, you sons of Jacob, that's why you are not consumed. It's almost says, I don't break covenant. It sounds like he said, that's why you ain't all ate up. No, he says. But the word consume in the text has to do, let me see, uh, uh, has to do with trying to accomplish or finish or become something. He says, I don't break covenant even when you rebel against me. If you are suffering punishment for rebellion, it's not because I broke covenant. It's because you broke covenant. And what you are not doing is a reflection on you because you were told to do it. So God says, I don't break covenant. Say amen to that. 
You could, can you imagine the number of people don't give a dime and still ask God to be healed and he'll still heal them? Because he don't break covenant. But watch this. He says, you, it is impossible for you to become what I desire for you to become. It is impossible for you to finish what I desire for you to finish. And it, is, it is impossible for you to complete any task because you won't honor the covenant. Why do you think people today uh, don't keep their word? There was a time when all a person had was their word. Now, people lie to you, and you know something? You don't even think anything of it. But when you become, it has to do with character. Giving has to do with what kind of character you have. God says, my character is this. I don't break my covenants. When I say I'm going to agree to something with you, I'm going to stick to it. Regardless of what you do, I'm going to stick to it. We break covenant with God and don't even have a, a remorse or anything else concerning it about. Just break it. But we see, like I said, but we don't understand when we break covenant, we cease to have the backing of God to accomplish that which he wants us to accomplish. But like I said before, it don't really matter to many believers because they haven't realized any manifestation of anything God is doing anyway. So I can't miss what I never had. <laughs> Say amen that. Maybe that's why the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe a lot of believers haven't tasted, so they don't know what it tastes like, so you can't miss what you never tasted. See? We just say things like that because it sounds good. But really, think about it. How many, how many believers you know in your circle actually have had any visible manifestation of the presence of God in their life? Because not only should they be able to see it, others should be able to see it. That's the text, right? Say amen to that. Now, so he says, I changed not. Then in verse number 7, he says, even from the days of your father. What, look here. Here it is. Here's. Even though from the days of your father you are gone away from mine ordinances, you have stopped doing what I told you to do. Hint. Now, many believers in church today get mad or whatever the case may be or get mad with the pastor back in my day. People, used to, if they didn't think the money was being spent the way they're supposed to spend it, you know, they, they just lock up their wallets and wouldn't give anything. Well, uh, if you notice on your tithing envelopes here, we have on the bottom a disclaimer which says we choose to use the funds as it best meets the needs of the church. So when you put money in there, that means you agree with that. You see that? Because I cannot operate the church based on from where you see. If I did, we'd be in big trouble. Big trouble. I have to operate it based on how the Spirit of God guides me in what to do here. Say amen to that. But then when, when, a, when the leader recognizes that certain things need to be done for the work of God to increase. Say increase. See, the work of God must always increase. The work of God is not based on your level of comfort. It always has to increase. And the, when, when you see the increase of the work of God, that means there's an uh, inanimate number of people being affected by that church in that local vicinity. Say amen to that. All right, here we go. All right, y'all all right. Y'all all right. He says, for even from the days of your father, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Then he tells them, he said, return unto me and I will return to you. See that? Return to me and I return to you. Isn't it amazing that you can be away from God and not even know it, not even realize it? He says, return to me and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But he said, uh, wherein shall we, how? then they goes, well, how can we return? How can we return to you? See, in their mind, they hadn't left. There's a difference between going to church out of habit and being to church out of learning. How can we return? We still come to Mass every day. We still doing the things we always do. How can we return? How can we return? So look at it. It's, how can we return? And then the next thing he says, then he goes into the method now. This is, he says, returning means this. Now, you ever notice that in the church, I've noticed it, people do not have a problem 
coming back to God when they've strayed away and done wrong. Say amen to that. They'll stay away, but they'll come out to the church, and then they'll come back down here again, and they say, I want to recommit my life to God. Say amen to that. They don't understand that when you're coming back and you recommit your life, you're recommitting your wallet too. But we keep that separate. Now, watch the text. Y'all all right? Did you go home? Then in verse number 8, as he begins to explain to them this idea of what returning looks like and what happened when they left. He says, look at verse number 8. He says, will a man do what? He said, will a man rob God? That's the question he asked him. And then he answered it himself. Yeah. Yes, a man can rob God. See, when you think in terms of that, you think in terms of you can't rob God. Yes, you can because everything belongs to God. Now. You know what your pastor is really beginning to realize in the latter years of his life as God reveals more and more scripture to him? That the Bible is not just for y'all. It's not your personal book. It's a book that was written for mankind. So these principles, if a person who could care less about Word of Life Fellowship will follow them, They'll have all the visitation of God they can handle. They can go to hell, but they'll still have it. Say amen to that. See, many church folk believe that the Bible is just for, well, if the Bible is just for the church, then the church should be the most prosperous organization on the planet. It is true when God set up, you ought to read the book about Ezekiel sometimes and understand how the position that God wanted his people to be in when it comes to advising the world and governments on how to live. They don't know what God wants. We do. At least that's what we say. Y'all all right or did you go home? I sense a vacancy in the room. Y'all all right? So, so he says, so will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. So you have taken what belongs to God. What did we take? You took my tithes, man. And you took my offerings. When you decided to keep it for yourself, you took it from me. Because robbing means to take something from someone that belongs to them. And the first, now watch it. The first of everything belongs to God. Now, like I said before, in those days, it was, it was animals and goats and different things like that. Say amen to that. Now, you don't have a goat. You don't have any animals. So for, to you, it equates to money. So that means the first of all monies you get, the first tenth goes to God. The first money of, of all I get, the first tenth goes to God. It belongs to him. That belongs to him by his right as sovereign. It belongs to him. It ain't yours. And we ain't going to get into all of that net, gross, and all that kind of stuff. We'll let the Spirit of God work that out. But in, in the grand scheme, we, we may not have time to get to all, but so in the grand scheme of things, when we decide not to give, we rob God because that really belongs to him. All right, now, so he says, yet you robbed me, then, but we, you say, how have we robbed you? What did we take that was yours? He says, in tithes and offering. Two things. Tithe, that first ten. That's mine. You can't send it to heaven. Give it to the guy in the temple. I'm holding him accountable with what he should do with it. Don't worry about anything else. You have to do your part and get the blessings. I take care of them if they don't do it right. Oh, yeah. Watch it now. You know, because I, in the early years of my coming through church, I used to hear people all the time, I ain't giving because they won't do this and they won't do that. And, and you, you kind of adopt the same mindset until you understand what the Word of God says. Now, watch this. Watch this. Everybody here who has a job, right? There's somebody that gets your money before you even see it. They call that Uncle Sam. Right? Now, you mean to tell me they take your money before you even see it? All of us do that. It, it's FICA, ICA, this, that, and the other, all that kind of stuff, right? They, they've named it all kind of things, but it takes the money from us. And that's fine because God tells us, render unto Caesar's, what's the Caesar? They t do they take too much? Yes. They do take too much, but that's fine. 
You know why that's fine? Because God says, you just give me the portion I want, and I'm still going to make it all right. They can't take enough from you to break you if you do right by me. Same in there. But you adopt the mindset of folks sitting around you because you in church, they in church, and you just figure they right by what they say. You know, so you adopt that mindset, thinking like they say, acting like they act about giving and different things. So you, you kind of develop this hostility towards giving. And every time it's time to give, your whole attitude changes. Same in there. Until you realize and get a manifestation from the Holy Spirit of what the scriptures have to say concerning giving. Then you understand that when you get that type of revelation, then you understand, okay, this is personal. This ain't got nothing to do with my neighbor on my left or my neighbor on my right. This is between me and God. And whether anybody wants to do or not, I've got to make a decision from here if I'm going to participate in this giving part of my relationship with God, which is a requirement of the kingdom order. Say amen to that. So when I got that revelation, I just began to give. Everything. Everything you get. You know, the little unexpected check. Break God off for it. When people pay you back, break God up. Everything, you begin to, because why? The first of everything belongs to God. It's my way of recognizing that he has taken care of me and provided for me and done everything for me. It's my way of acknowledging how prevalent and how important he is in my life. Say amen to that. And when I decide not to do that, I take what belongs to him and keep it for myself. That makes me a robber. Then he says, but you robbed me two ways. You took my tithe. The tenth. That first one, that's mine. What if I were to rob you of Jesus? See, you have to base everything because Jesus, right? Jesus belonged to God. He gave him to us. Right? If he'd have kept him, he would have been robbing us. But since God don't break covenant, he gave him, right? And so now I'm going to hold back $10? And he released Jesus? Well, do the best you can with that. Now, so he says then, so he says in the text, you robbed me in tithes and offer. Tithes is the first ten. Say first. Now, this is a, this is a, yeah, this is a, okay. To give God that first all the time requires some discipline on behalf of the giver. Now, especially in the society, back in the day when you, most people give out their pockets, it was hard then. When they started writing checks, it was hard. It's even harder now with technology because a lot of things get in the way. Same in that. So a person has to be really disciplined. Even me sometimes, I forget to write that check first or give first, depending on what I'm doing and where I am. See, because you can do it so many places, so many things, sometimes I forget. And I, and I, but I, I, when I remember, I go right back in there and take care of it. You see, so that, it takes real discipline to make sure you maintain that, that, I, that attitude and that giving God that first tent first. Say amen to that. You have to really be determined to do that. He says, but you robbed me in tithes. But let's look at these two things, tithes and offering. He didn't say you sell chicken dinners. He didn't say do no raffles. He didn't say have no Miss America pageants. He says the giving is based on two things, tithes and offering. The first tenth belongs to God. Well, what is that offering? all about in israel day the tithe had to do with the first of all their work and, and effort and things like that the second the offering had to do with materials and the materials they would donate to the temple for the expanding of the temple or the building of things connected to the temple so that the work of god could continue forward tithes and offering now unless i have some people out here with some lumber yards and some concrete mixers, you don't have that. So your tithes and offering comes in the forms of the first tenth, and then another offering on top of that, which we would use then for the expanding or, or the, the building so that the facilities can accommodate and continue to do the work of God. Does that make sense to you? It has to make sense to you. That is the only two ways of giving God has given the church. No pie selling. No fish fries. Now what? Because when you do that, it shows lack of intelligence in the word of God. And that is done out of ignorance. 
And God does not want his people to be ignorant. See, what has happened is we just, we, years ago, we just subsidized and did what we wanted to do because we didn't know what God wanted. And it would come from the pulpit to do whatever. You, you can sell some chicken and then give God. No, you don't want to sell chicken in the name of the church. Now, if selling chicken is your business, that's fine. You get paid for it. Then you break God off his tithes and offering out of what you get paid out of. But we don't do that in the name of the church. It's embarrassing when people of, the, people of God stand on a corner and sell chicken and fish in the name of the church to raise funds for the church. But you know something? You get more money from people doing that than any other way because they think that way. But it casts the church in a poor light because it, show, it casts the church as poverty stricken, prosperity minus, when we're supposed to be the richest entity on the planet. But you know what I like about the whole thing now? See, God's not holding everybody. See, I can work this principle myself and reap the benefits all by myself. Say amen to that. But we're talking about as, a, as a, a group of believers. Say amen to that. Is it really that difficult to believe that God wants all his children to be well, well, well off? It may mean we will have to do some, we have to think differently which then will make us do some things differently. Say amen to that. It, because we come to understand that having money is a good thing. Amen. Now, being in love with the money is not a good thing. But having money is a real, 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 real good thing. Because having it means you can do something about certain situations. Say amen to that. That's why you say somebody, you, you want to, I need to witness to somebody. They, they hadn't eaten in, eaten in months. Let me tell you about the Lord. Really? Really? I'm hungry, man. I ain't ate in a month. Well, let me, the Lord will feed you. No, you're going to get out of your pocket. Buy them something to eat. Get them nice and full. Then they're ready to receive what you have to say from the Lord because you've demonstrated. See that? Now, so he says in the text, you've robbed me in what? Tithes and... Offering. Again, this has to do with, when we talked about years ago, mindset, it has to do with, first of all, having a, developing a different mindset concerning the Word of God and understanding that what I have is really not mine. It belongs to God. It all belongs to Him. And He only asks for a portion of it back. That portion He asks back is so that His work can continue. Now, believe it or not, I believe every church is going to have to stand before God and give an account on how many folk they brought in. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you now, it is impossible to bring people into the body of Christ through the salvation process without funds. You need money to do that. And the evangelism takes money. It takes money. I was telling my youth minister today, you know, it wouldn't be impossible for me to see that at some point, even in our journey, that if we were to really be concerned about bringing people into the body of Christ, that we might not have to, well, we might have to build some kind of apartment building to house folk, to help them live in a different environment till they get on their feet. Say amen to that. Uh, but but you, can't, you can't help somebody when they're living in a place that is constantly against them, constantly causing problems, and they need a change and all you can say, we praying for you. See? So, so the idea, so the, the work, the, the, and, and, you know, and God's work is not just conducive to us being saved. And just a few of us. And see, that's what's happened sometimes sometime to the church. We've gotten so inwardly focused, we forgot we're supposed to reach out. But when you start reaching out, that means people's pocketbooks going to be affected. And people don't want their pocket. That is why, I, I told you last week, that's why many, many churches today are seeking to do, aug, do augmented programs uh, and then get grants for those programs. Say amen to that. And they call them something different. They call them separate from the church. But when they take that money from the government, the government dictates the terms of its use. They dictate the terms of how you use it. They dictate the terms of what you can say and what you can do with their money in the plan. God says if you give right, you don't have to be whole hostage by anybody. 
Say amen to that. Now, the, the key for us is, you know what the key for us in this? Is to be able to, to by faith believe that even in a world we live in, where they seem to scrutinize every dollar, can God actually, by his sovereign power, go into that pagan system and draw me out wealth? The answer to that is yes, because it's not based on the wealth of this country. It's based on his wealth and riches and glory in heaven. That's what we talked about last week. He said, I will, he said, I will bless you. Uh, what he said, I will bless you. It's based on my riches. Now, you had, what is God's riches? Everything. He owns it all. It's, a, it's so much stuff down here. No one person could in no way hold it. But it's just kind of impossible. And then you got, you got your naysayers, right? Say naysayers. Naysayers are folk who are so pigeon-toed minded that they, they, they talk against uh, big, big congregations, big buildings, all that. You don't need all of that. Well, if you service thousands of people, you need a big place to service them. Say amen to that. You need something more than just a little hut on the corner. Say amen to that. Uh, to service people if you serve a God who is that big. Say amen to that. Remember I told you about the tabernacle? One day I hope to do a study on that. That thing was four, hundred, four football fields long. God, what you need with something that big? You're only going to come down to one small part of it. Why do you need something that big? Because God is big like that. And the sooner the church gets to realize my, the God that I serve, he does not know how to do anything mediocre or halfway or below par. It's either all or nothing with God. He don't know how to do anything else. Say amen to that. Now what I have done, see that's just why I have to develop my mind in the word of God so I can let God by his spirit through the word of God expand my thought process. I need my thought process expanded to the possibilities of what God can do through me and with me if I can just let it go in here. Does that make sense to anybody? See amen to that. Now, now, oh, it just came to me. It just came to me. For a lot of us, we spent so many years in the world. I'm by myself. I know. It's all right. It's cool, though. We spent so many years in the world. When we do come to God, that little exposure we get, we want to stop right there. Because that little exposure is a gazillion times better than where we were. And God's like, no, no, no. Don't freeze me out now. We haven't even begun to expose to you who I am and what you can be. But I got to get it. See a minute. That. That's why the enemy, that's why the enemy is constantly presenting temptations to me that keep my thinking dwarfed. Small. Because if he can keep my thinking small, by introducing me to things that I do that keep my thinking small, I'll stay small. I never develop into who God sees me and what God wants me. I'll stay small because if I, when I stay small in my eyesight, I look big. And then he says, he said, but you robbed me in tithes and offering." And that, 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 so, so that means the, the first tenth belongs to God. And then there's another contribution over and above that that goes to the actual ministry of the, 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 the for the ministry of God. So that God will always have enough resources for his work to continue. That God will always have enough resources for his work to continue. That God will always have enough resources so his work can continue. That God will always have enough resources so his work can continue. That God will always have enough resources. Now I'm going to switch it. That God will always have more than enough resources so that when work needs to be done, it can get done as opposed to not being able to do it because the resources are not there. See, because now for you and I, everybody here say, everybody here who know they say, raise your hand. If you know you say, raise your hand. All right? For us, say amen to that. We don't need to be brought to the Lord anymore. <laughs> right? And, and 
And for those of us, if you're still wondering or confused or in doubt about your salvation, there is something really, 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 really wrong with you. See, but sometimes that's be the case. Sometimes people are so uh, unlearned about their own personal salvation, say amen to that, they're always questioning it, always doubting it because they may slip, trip, or fall, or fall and can't get up, whatever the case may be. And so they're constantly and continually, oh, I don't know if this. I'm, that's the enemy messing with your head. And when he messes with your head like that, the thing you're going to do is not give. Do the best you can with that. Amen. Now, look what he says now. This last part is really kind of maybe a little difficult to understand. And it's not tricky, but you have to really understand Scripture. Now, uh, I told you before, we looked in the Bible, and we saw that tithing was first introduced with Abraham. We saw that, right? And he did it out of gratitude for that lopsided victory he had going to get Lot, right? So you could look at that as, right, God, Abraham was really grateful for the ability to go save Lot from them folk who had kidnapped him. That's kind of like evangelism, right? So, in that, so, so to show his gratitude towards God, God brought uh, Melchizedek on the scene, and he gave him 10% of all he had out of gratitude. Say me to that. Well, what happens then? What happens then? So that tithing was started before law. That's very significant. See, because if you listen to some New Testament saints, they'll say, tithing started in the New Testament. No, it didn't. It started in the Old Testament, and God put that in place before law. You saw it in Scripture. See, that's what I, that's what I go by. That he says, she says stuff. No, we saw that, right? So now, so God, so, so God is recanting to them uh, uh, that something that they had stopped doing, that he had implemented before they, he even gave them the law. Mm -hmm. Now, in verse number nine, he says, because you have robbed me and tithed and offered, he says, you are cursed with a curse. Now, now that, now, you know, for people who believe in hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo stuff, you know, which is kind of like some of our backgrounds. Say, I mean, I think everybody's background has some witchcraft or something in it because that's how most people started. Say, amen to that. So, but the idea, it's not like somebody going to point two fingers and say the same thing you've done to me. Is already done back to you. <laughs> Everything you've done to me is already done to you. That brother got so scared, boy, he's like, his, his whole philosophy of living changed. <laughs> but anyway, God says, because you, he's talking to Israel now, because you robbed me in tithes and offerings, he says, you are cursed with a curse. Now, that doesn't mean God has, has, uh, orchestrated anything against you because if God were to orchestrate something against you, it would really be a terrible thing. But the idea is, right, and again, like I said, it has to do with, too, being able to have experienced the blessings of God in our lives and then those blessings not be uh, manifested in our life. But he says, you are cursed with a curse. Why? Because, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Oh, y'all, the whole next, you have robbed me. You took what belonged to me and kept it for yourself. Now, watch it. The idea of curse, the first curse, he says, you are cursed, C-U-R-S-E-D. It meaning there will be obstacles in your way. And the obstacles that are in your way are the things that I was moving when you did right by me. You ever notice why your money is never longer than the month. You're making the same money. You got the same expenses, but the money seemed to always run out before the month. Why is that? Could it be because God is not getting his first? Because in order to give him first, you have to by faith believe that he can take the remainder of that and meet your needs without you being broke. Without you going broke. See, we look at it from the numbers perspective. I got X amount of dollars. I got Y number of bills. Okay, if I pay, if I give God first, that means this amount won't meet X number of bills. Well, now I'm operating in fear instead of faith. And I'm telling you, if you operate in fear, go and pay your bills. Go and pay your bills. I don't want you to go against your fear. 
and try to give God tithes when you don't have faith for it? Because it won't work for you without faith. So keep it. Pastor, you know what you're saying, my wife. You know what you're saying? No, I'm telling people to operate for real. But understand, there are going to be obstacles in your way. Even if you keep it, it's never going to do what it's supposed to do. Say me to that. I, 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 was, I was writing some checks, uh, I think it was last month. Anyway, write some checks, and I wrote my tie check out, and I was doing this. And sometimes I get busy and don't, don't bounce the checkbook down. I just kind of go ahead on and do the thing, you know, do it. So I had finished everything, mail off, and threw the checkbook back in the drawer and went on about my business, right? And, you know, I, you don't even think about that, that kind of stuff. You know, I, I got other things to think about than paying lights and water bills and stuff like that. I mean, I have to do it, but that's really not an important thing. So anyway, so I had to go to, uh, I think... I had to either go to the mall or I go somewhere do something. Anyway, I wanted to buy something. I was like, I didn't know if I had the money. I just figured, well, you know, okay. I just used my debit card. The thing went through. So I went to my bank account and checked. I had over $600 left in there. Then I looked down at the checks. All the checks was in. I'm like, where did that money come from? And I heard the Spirit of God says, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Ain't no other explanation. Ain't nobody give me no money. Ain't nobody, because bank, no bank ain't going to make no mistake like that. Because if you do and this, you spend it, they're going to come back and find it. That happened to me one time. I got somebody's income tax check by mistake from the teacher's credit union, $3,000 plus. I just knew the Lord had blessed me. I just knew he had blessed me, man. I got, man, I looked at that thing. I saw that three grand. I went and checked and nobody could tell me nothing and nobody could find anything like that. I didn't think about the end of the month. They're going to review all them deposits that come in, electronic and stuff. Man, I had a field day with that three grand. Gave God some of it and everything. Say amen to that. But when they called me and said, you know, we've been checking the account and we found out the number that my account was one number off than the other person's account. They gave me that tax. And I had to pay it back. But you know what? I had the money to pay it back. They said, all you got to do is just give us the same amount back. She said, and I said, I said, well, look in there. She said, well, it's still in there. some money still in there. Is it enough to cover that? I said, yes. Man, I had spent all that money. I thought I had spent all that money still sitting there. I said, well, just go ahead on and take it and move it on over there. She took it and moved over, and I still had about 300 to the good. Man, I'm telling you. Same in that. So anyway, back to my original story. So I went in there and started looking, looking, at, looking at that thing. I'm like, wow, I'm looking. And I'm, you know, and this is the main thing. When God bless you like that, even when you go back in and do the math, the math works. Yeah. Where did this $500 come from? I don't know. But when you do it up and do the math, it works. So I don't even try to figure it out. It blows my mind. All I want you to do, God, do it again. This time do it 25 to the 10th power. Say amen to that. So there are, this, this is what God wants us to understand, you know, to not give those obstacles be in our way. Now watch it. It, it helps, he helps the believer understand just how much God does for us from day to day to day. So he said, you're cursed with a curse. <clears throat> um... And then he says, so you, he says, uh, you are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Uh, it has to do, uh, uh, remember, um, curse with the curse. It has to do with this type of uh, metaphor, I believe. Remember back on 9-11 when those planes crashed into the World Trade Centers and, and how they caught all of us off guard? Say a minute that. We, were, we probably won't know until years down the road. That was a strategic plan orchestrated by the enemy. And God knew it was going to happen. And he kind of moved his hand to let it happen. To show us how far away as a nation we have drifted from him. Yes, sir. That's why everybody's trying to explain it. Why? Now, God didn't let it happen. We made that happen. You know why? Because along the way, every one of those guys who was flying those planes came to America to learn how to fly. They paid, everywhere they went to learn, they paid in cash to take those lessons. You would think that the person who trained them would want to, man, all you want to know how to do is take off and not land. You don't want to land, you just want to take off. But see, America is so greedy 
there, there, was a, there was a little place down in Sarasota somewhere where they learned when you drop $100,000 on a person, they ain't going to ask no questions. They'll teach you how to take off and, and do just that. So somebody knew. Say amen to that. It has a soul. So when we decide not to give, it's almost like we take God's hands of protection and move it away from us. Now, that same hand that protects is the same hand that provides. You see? And so it's almost like when we decide not to give to God, we remove his protection and we remove his provisions away from us, from the giving. Say amen to that. Now, so he says, uh-uh. So practicing tithing was, since it was done before Abraham. Now, if there's some other texts that prove in the New Testament we're supposed to continue to tithe. Say amen to that. It's not done away with. It's not just an Old Testament thing that we're supposed to do. It's a Bible thing that we're supposed to do. Now, God said this, in his economy, that system will work wonders. Say amen to that. And the church will always have more than enough of what it needs to carry on the work of God. Say amen to that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's see, can we cover for it? Look at verses 7 through 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse number 7. Can y'all catch me back there in the back? Uh, he says, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse number 7, Paul writes, Who goeth a wall for any time at his own charge? Who planteth a vineyard? And eateth not of the fruit thereof. Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of the flock. He giving us an analogy. Look at verse number 10. Uh, say I these things as a man or say not the law the same also. Next day. For it is risen the, in the law of Moses. Thou shalt not do what? Muzzle the mouth of the ox that, te- that treaded out the corn. Uh, does God take care of the oxen? Yeah. He says, or say it, he is altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be, be, a, be a partaker of this hope. Say amen to that. If we have sown, sown, give, tithe unto you spiritual things, it is a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things. That idea of giving, he's talking about the man who delivers the word and he should receive of the people he would give that word through finances. He, he ought to have a job. If I go get a job, I ain't working here. I don't need to work here and work there. And I don't need to make more out there than I do here. See, I, these are the things I had to learn. See, because everybody, well, he ought to have a job. Just, I mean, he does have a job. And his job is to help you stop thinking like that. <laughs> Your wife, she just laughs so loud. Here. <laughs> Say amen to that. Because if you're thinking like that, then the pastor ain't doing his job. Say amen to that. You, you get that? So, so tithing is very, very, I wish I had more time. Tithing is very much New Testament, just like it is Old Testament. He just specifies in New Testament that the man who works hard. That's why you always say that word. He's due of double honor. The guy who labors in the word is due double honor. You know what that means? Double the money. That don't mean double the cakes. That don't mean double the pies. It means double the money. Say amen to that. Give me the money. I got my own pie. Say amen to that. Now you better, well, that, that, that's that scripture. Now when you go to work, don't you work for money? So Friday they're going to say, we got pies for you. Man, I'm going to hear your mouth. You're going to be saying some things and acting in a way. You might be shooting people. You're going to pay me in what? And then the, the Duke people go, you can get them pies from if you want, but we're not taking them. So you give me a pie, my light bill people ain't going to take no pie. My car, no, no pie. When I go to the doctor, they don't want no pie. This ain't Doc Baker back on Gunsmoke. Where the people can't pay him, they bring him a couple of chickens, and he go, it's all good. No, Doc Baker want two, three hundred dollars, and he going to see me about two, min- two or three minutes. So I can't spend no pie, plus they make you fat anyway. You can look at me and tell I don't like that. Say amen to that. Does that help anybody? 
See, you, we, see now, this, this is the mindset we have to develop because, right, I have to develop that mindset because I am submitting myself to obey the word of God. That's it. What other people choose to do is up to them. I'm going to choose to obey the word of God. And then by doing that, I will reap all those benefits that God says I will reap. It would be good if we could all get it together. But everybody's not going to agree with God like that. But the person who does, they will get it. They will have it. And it will be manifested in their life. And everybody will see. Does that make sense to anybody? And so like I said, we could talk all year on money. Because we got to learn, understand how to use it. How to invest it. How to get the best out of it. Because it's a tool. It's a tool that we use to ex in exchange for goods and services. Say amen to that. Glory be to God. So uh, now... And now, uh, let's see if I got time for another one. What time is it? Oh, here he is. No, I got to stop. It's 1030. All right, let's go. Okay, now, now, we'll move on in, in, in uh, worship service. I'm going to take you straight on through this passage to the next part where he says, bring ye tithes into the storehouse. But you are ahead of that crowd because now you got real good background on when we get to bring the tithes what God is talking about and then we're going to see the benefits that come with doing that say amen to that I don't know about y'all but I just love this stuff I love this word of God because it's, it's so never gets stale never gets old say amen to that but you guys are ahead of them because y'all got this little piece amen alrighty y'all bless the Lord any, any questions any questions again what does it require to tithe Faith. It requires faith in the word of God to tithe. Say amen to that. Now, now, let me give you another story. Back in the early days, uh, when I wasn't making any money, let me see, I think, heck, yeah, wasn't making no money, right? So you're not tithing, you're not going to start tithing with the big bucks right away. Because it's going to depend on your growth in the knowledge of God's word. See, cause so, so in order to get to be that big giver, that means God's got to give you some promotion. Mm -hmm. And which means you've got to start doing some things differently where you presently work. Say amen to that. Say amen to that. See, see that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean everybody's going to be, some of you are going to be in business for yourself. You're scared right now. God had already told you, but you're scared. You're scared to do it because you're looking at, well, I can't do this. I ain't nobody told you to depend on I. He's already told you. There's no way he could have not told you. There's no way he could have not told you or shown you that he wants you to do this for business for yourself. You're just scared because you think you're going to have to do this and you can't afford that and you don't see yourself doing this and how other people see you and you this and you that and you can't and you ain't and all of this you're going through. Keep on going through that. The next person he's going to show going to do it, and then you'll be like, talk, I had that idea. Yeah, he didn't act on it. Say amen to that. So while you still contemplating the system of I, somebody's going to say, God, let's do this. Say amen to that. Glory be to God. I wish it was me. See, but if I go into my own business, I'm going to have to quit this. I'm going to have to quit this. I look in Scripture, I don't, I, the only guy I saw in Scripture that was by vocation was Paul. He did it by choice. You know why he did it by choice? I show you in the Scripture because he didn't want people saying he was taken from the church wrongly. He did it by choice. But I ain't going to be working no full-time job and coming here teaching y'all. I'm not. I just go out there because I can go get the money. Hey, God has qualified me to do a number of things and got paper to back it up. <laughs> Say amen to that. I ain't trying to be nasty with you. I'm just saying, but it don't make sense. Because if I go to work, if I go get a full-time job, I did that thing by vocational pastor. It's taxing. And if y'all knew what I do even now, you'd be like, that man need to raise three times to the tenth power. Say amen to that. Okay, can't get no amens out of this crowd. Say amen to that. But I believe if I do decide to go to work, I cannot do that and do this effectively at the same time. 
So I have to depend on God to take care of us. That's right. Say amen to that. All righty. All righty. So, so uh, any other questions? Any, well, any questions? Y'all all right? 